So today I'm mostly going to be talking to you about um, a little classifier I built to, to basically um, detect a certain type of star that I worked on um, during my time as an astronomer. So just quick introduction, I'm Sandra. I'm a data scientist at LIST. Uh, so if you uh, just heard Eddie's talk this morning, we're an online fashion platform. We aggregate millions of products uh, from the web and um, uh, basically we have a, quite a good data science team there and we do a lot of interesting data science so come and grab me or any, anyone else from the data science team at LIST if you want to know more about our projects because I'm not talking about it today. Um, instead, I'm actually going to be talking to you about astronomy and astrophysics because that's what my background is. Um, so I spent a lot of time playing with this telescope uh, back in the day when I was an astronomer. Um, it's um, in La Palma, one of the Canary Islands, um, and it's one of the two uh, UK-owned telescopes that um, we have there. Um, basically, uh, what you do is you end up applying for time on telescopes and you get it, good for you, you go out there and you observe the stars. So I'm, I was mostly an observational astronomer. I did most of my research uh, was around observing stars and looking for a specific type of star, which I'm going to get to now. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's mostly my background. Um, that wasn't actually a good observing run. The weather was really bad, as you can see. We can't even see the skies. It was just really cloudy, but still doesn't, doesn't change the fact that it was always like super magical and, and amazing when you go out there. So as I said, I have a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics. That's my background. And what I did most of my time as an astronomer was I searched for uh, specific types of stars um, that it's easy to describe as dead stars. It's basically what m our stars are going to be at the end of their lives. Um, they're known as white dwarfs, neutron stars, or stellar mass black holes. Um, most of the stars in our universe are actually going to end up as white dwarfs. By most, I mean like 98% of them. And those are the ones that I actually focused on. And uh, the way I did it was uh, using uh, what we call uh, large sky surveys. Uh, so um, they're surveys of the sky um, using um, wide field cameras attached to telescopes and they just observe big patches of the sky in um, di using different filters and um, just basically try to do as much of it and and you end up with like really big catalogs of, of stars and just objects basically in the sky. Um, and the reason why I focus on white dwarfs was a because my supervisor was obsessed with them but also um, they were the most common ones, so they were the easiest ones in a way to look for. And not only did I look for white dwarfs, I actually looked for what we called um, hydrogen rich white dwarfs, so the ones that had hydrogen in their atmospheres, because they were also the most common ones. Um, and okay, I, did, I, I won't go into too much detail, I looked for the ones that were also pulsating, but that's just like a side point. Um, and I mostly used, as I said, large sky surveys to do that. And I'll get to um, like explain to that really quickly. And what the way I did it was I used um, color color diagrams uh, to select the stars that I thought that I basically thought were white dwarfs. And then the way you then confirm their identities and you know for sure that they are white dwarfs is um, by using spectroscopy. So basically, s sky surveys are, as I said, um, uh, observations of big patches of the sky uh, using different filters and what you do with the what you get with the filters is basically the brightness of a star in certain wave band ranges and what's great about that is that um, you can then determine the color of a star when you've got their brightnesses in different filters because just the the difference between um, the brightness of a star in different filters is what we call a color and a color is a very cheap and rough proxy of a star's effective temperature. So you can have a rough idea if a star is uh, basically bright in blue filters, so blue colors, it's hot, whereas if it's bright in red, then it's quite, it's cooler than a, bright, a blue star. So you can, if you know the properties of the stars that you're looking for, then you can basically just decide, okay, well, I know it's gonna be quite blue because it's, it's a hot star. I should look at blue filters and then and then kind of like select my candidates using, using that. So here is basically um, what I used. Oh, it's, uh, it's not really, you can't really see the, 
the labels on the side. Uh, but yeah, this is basically what a color color diagram looks like. Those are the ones that I use to look for my um, white dwarfs. And um, you basically have a, a space in uh, the color color diagrams where you have an idea of where they're going to fall. Um, basically, the, the black grayish areas are where, or it's what we call the main sequence, and it's where most of the stars will spend most of their lives in. So that's why they're like really dense areas in a, in a, in a plot like that. And then white dwarfs are obviously not as common as most stars in the universe. So um, they'll, they'll sit in like slightly um, outside uh, regions. And uh, the dotted lines are just theoretical lines. But anyway, I basically had this like, found this area in color space where I could find my white dwarfs. And the reason why these actually fall in, in quite a distinct region here, I've got the R minus H alpha color there, is because they're hydrogen rich, so they've got um, quite strong hydrogen absorption lines in their, in their spectra, and that's why they actually stand out really well. So I could like very confidently say these are probably white dwarfs, and now I, oh, the only way to confirm them is by using spectroscopy. Yeah, so these are colors. So, so R is basically um, a filter that was, it's a red filter in the, um, in the survey that I used. I is another filter, U, G as well, and then there's H alpha, which is also another sort of reddish filter. And um, the difference in filters is the color of a star. So those are just two different color color diagrams, basically. Um, and this is more like a reddish one, and this is blue, ooh, shouldn't move. And this is a blue sort of color color diagram. Um, and yeah, so depending on like the types of stars that you're looking for, you can then um, use the color space to have a rough idea of like, uh, you know, the, the top uh, left corner there is where like the really the blue hot stars live. And then the further down bottom right corner you go, uh, the cooler they will be, basically. A, a dot, a dot here. Those ones, yeah, they're actually all white dwarfs, the circles. Um, and th the ones, and then the gray scale is like, it's, I, I just um, binned them because there are a lot more dots. Like, there were millions of stars in, in that catalog. So I just basically just use a gray scale to. Yeah, yes, yeah. It's the, each one of those circles and squares is actually one star in the, um, in the sky, in our, in our own um, galaxy because that's what I looked at. Um, so yeah. And then, as I said, the only way to actually confirm these stars is to look at their spectra. And a spectrum of a star is basically its light intensity is a function of wavelength, um, as you can see here. So that's just the flux. And then the wavelength in um, angstrom, this is an optical wavelength, because most of the observations you do from the ground, you'll use like optical, um, an optical range. Um, this is actually the spectrum of a white dwarf and a, a hydrogen rich white dwarf. The lines that you see, these absorption lines, are hydrogen lines. And it was taken from a survey called the Sloan Digi Digital Sky Survey, SDSS, which was a really big survey that was designed and done in the US uh, by astronomers there. Um, and basically, what, what happens in, um, when, you, when you measure the spectrum of a star, what you see is um, the light um, that the photons that come that pass through a cooler gas, so typically the atmosphere of the star, and then it, before it reaches you, the observer, and that's where the absorptions happen, and that's where you can detect what elements are in the uh, in the atmosphere of the star, and that's how you can know exactly what type of star it is. So this is kind of like what you what you look for if you're looking for a white dwarf. You want it to look kind of like this, or a DA white dwarf, like a hydrogen-rich white dwarf. Um, and just quickly to explain spectroscopy, what happens is you, you place like an adjustable slit at the focal point of a telescope, and then you, um, you uh, get, um, use a collimator to get parallel uh, rays, and then a grating, um, um, a grater to disperse the light, and then um, you detect it into a detector. Um, and that's what kind of like gives you all the, the different wavelength range that you get. So I spent a lot of my time uh, using surveys to pick out my stars and then go and, and, um, and then get their spectra and confirm their IDs. 
which was great because I only had 50 white dwarfs to go and, and confirm. Those were the number of candidates I had. Not a huge amount of, of white dwarfs I had to do. But then I shared an office with a student who used to sit there for hours, and I'm not exaggerating, days probably, manually classifying spectra of stars. And he was also, we had the same supervisor, so he was also looking for white dwarfs. And what he did was sit there, write this code that would uh, plot the spectrum of the star, mostly from SDSS, so the survey that I just mentioned. And, and he had those keys on his keyboard that he set, that, that, okay, that's a white dwarf, and that's an A-type star, that's a whatever type star, that's a quasar, that's whatever. And he did that for hours and hours and days and days. And I just felt so sorry for him because it just, just seemed like frustrating, but he had to do it to confirm that his method of selecting them was correct. And then when I left astronomy and I joined LIST and I discovered this whole world of data science and machine learning and all that, I just thought to myself, well, that's, that's silly. Why do you get a PhD student to do that? Why don't we just build a model to actually classify those stars that we're after? Um, since we've got so much data, well, surely it's a simple problem, right? Like, it's, to me at least, it seemed like if you're, if you're after one type of star, then you can at least build a simple, simple classifier to do that. So I emailed my supervisor and I was like, can you send me some data, please? I, I, I've got this like, model I want to build just to play around and see what it's like. So he did. He sent me um, about 8,500 spectra of DAY dwarfs from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And then he also sent me about 16,000 spectra of non-DAY white dwarfs. That's all I know about them. I just know that they're not white dwarfs. Um, most of them actually look like this. And this is a quasar, which is um, a, a basically a, a really, really bright object that's 100,000 100, times, no, 100 times brighter than the um, than our own galaxy. It's not within our galaxy. It's much further away. And, um, and yeah, so it's, it looks really different to a white dwarf. So this is actually, I think SDSS was designed to mostly find quasars. So there were loads. But in color space, if you're not using something like the H-alpha filter, they actually sit around where the white dwarfs sit as well. So they, they do have very similar colors to white dwarfs. And they will contaminate your, your white dwarf uh, candidates. Um, and, and so a lot of the times when you're actually going to go and get spectra of what you think are white dwarfs using your color color diagrams, you're going to find a lot of quasars and vice versa. So um, that's why I, I had a lot of quasars in my data set. So I'm found with a binary classification problem. It's quite simple. You've got you know, either a white dwarf or non-white dwarf. And I just thought, OK, that's simple. I'm g I've got labeled data. I'm just going to read my images, process them, feed them into some classifier, and then that's it. My problem is solved. And so that's kind of what I did. Um, I used, um, to process the images, I used a BISC image descriptor. And basically, <coughs> a descriptor is um, it's a type of function that, um, that you apply to your image uh, to describe it in a way that it's invariant to changes. And most we, we actually use the brisk uh, image descriptors at list uh, to detect duplicates. So it's really great if you've got like two images of products that are taken from um, different angles and stuff like uh, um, Eddie and Calvin at list, they, they use the brisk descriptor to actually detect a lot of the, the duplicate products that we had. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, each descriptor, depending on the one that you use, has a sampling pattern. This is the one that the brisk uh, descriptor has. And, um, and yeah, so for, the, for my problem, each descriptor was actually what I'll feed in as a feature of, um, of, my, um, uh, of my data. So for each image, I had basically a descriptor and a label. I split the data into 80% uh, training set, 20% testing. I used sklearn for all of this. Um, and uh, their support vector machine to, uh, for my classifier. And then um, I, I then used, uh, just to check the accuracy of my model, I also used cross-validation. And to go even deeper, what I did was actually looked for the best parameters using grid search. This, this bit took the longest. It actually ran for about 10 hours, um, which to me was quite long. But that was on my laptop. I didn't, I didn't uh, use anything fancy for that. And at the end, what I got was a model that could classify white dwarfs with an 85% accuracy, 
which to be honest, compared to a PhD student after days of doing this, is probably not far off what a human would do. <laughs> like wh wh when, I, when I turned around to my supervisor, or like my ex-supervisor, and I told him that, he was like, oh, that's, that's not far off what Nicola probably had. So I was like, okay, that's good. But I like, I'm like, we can definitely achieve better though. It's like such a simple problem. And the white dwarfs look so different to, to the um, quasars that mostly were the non-DA white dwarfs. So surely we can get better than that. Anyway, I had a chat with Eddie at List, and he was like, oh, you should definitely use neural nets. Like, you're definitely going to get much better than that. So I was like, OK, fine. So that's going to be like the next step. Uh, but yeah, most of the time, um, it, it, that, that I also looked at the confusion matrix to see like, how often it misclassifies things. And then what I also did was actually go deeper and see when, it was, when uh, stars were well classified and not very well classified. So, these were all classified as white dwarfs, DA white dwarfs. They all look like white dwarfs. In some cases, they're very noisy spectra because that's probably a really faint one. And then um, in other cases, they're, they're not as noisy. It's probably a much brighter one. And then those were the non-DA white dwarfs that the model found, which like compared to the white dwarfs, I mean, come on, they are really, really different. So it's, it's good, it works. But then you get the ones that were not classified very well. So that was classified as a non-DA, and I was like, um, why that is a white dwarf. I mean, it does actually look like one. Um, but in some cases, actually, I'm not surprised it, they were misclassified. So this one, for example, this is a white dwarf, a DA white dwarf, but it was classified as a non-DA. And compared to most white dwarfs, the absorption lines are actually not as broad as you would expect them to be. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not very surprising. And then in this case, like, this one's not as obvious either, but there's an extra like few absorption lines in different bits that are not expected in, uh, in a DA white dwarf. So that's why it, this shouldn't be classified as a DA white dwarf, but it actually did classify as one. So these are examples. I don't know why this one was classified as a DA white dwarf. I mean, this one's quite obvious. But anyway, I thought I'd look into it and see why, uh, I mean, see the cases that, I if the cases were obvious or not, um, that were misclassified. Anyway, I moved on from, the, from this this approach, and I thought, OK, well, let's go and look into neural nets and see if we can achieve a better accuracy using that. Um, so I did that. I, um, I, in, the, in the first case, I used OpenCV to do a lot of the image processing, because uh, they, they do have a built-in brisk uh, function that you could use. But in the deep learning case, I just need to read the images, and so I used Pillow. And, um, and then I processed the images to get it to um, be a 224 by 224 um, image, uh, and because that's what most architectures out there actually have. So I cropped them, and then um, in the case of the deep neural net, what I did was I actually used a balanced data set. So I had 50% white dwarfs and 50% non-white dwarfs. Um, just because when I wasn't using a balanced data set, my accuracy wasn't as good as when I just decided to use a balanced data set. So um, I thought, OK, I'd, st I'd stick to that, that method instead. So I, I stuck to 8,500 uh, DA white dwarfs and about 8,500 non-DA white dwarfs. So I had nearly 17,000 um, uh, points. They're all labeled as well. And that's sort of the architecture that I use. I use Keras for it, just because I, I just found it more natural to understand. Um, but I'm sure it would work perfectly well with you know, Chainer or anything else that you use. Uh, it's about five layers. And, and yeah, and then the, 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 mo the difference here is that you've basic, I've, all my images are black and white. So that's why it's one and then 224 by 224. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the architecture that I use. I'm, I'm going to push all of this to GitHub. So if anybody wants to have a look at it into more detail, then you, you'll get, sorry? Yeah, it's crazy. So, um, so yeah. So then, uh, that's basically how you kind of like fit the model. You use uh, I used an SGD um, optimizer, and then um, I ran it for ten epochs and using mini batches of about hundred, and and yeah. And then I basically evaluated my model. So th that trained in about five minutes. Like, didn't take long at all. Um, oh, I, I did use our GPU though, so maybe that's why it wasn't <laughs> very long. Um, and, and yeah, and then in this case, in the using a neural net, I got a 99% accuracy, which is like 
huge compared to what I was getting before. So I thought, and that was about 10 days ago. So I thought, oh my god, this is, this is great. I need more data and I need more, like better labeled data. I need to basically know what the non-DA white dwarfs are and try to like approach the problem differently because there are many classes of stars and if, if I can achieve this with just like a binary problem, like surely I can, I can sort of like do the same with even like even more complicated cases. So I sent an email to my supervisor. I don't have access to a strong, like the data from surveys anymore, um, but he still didn't get back to me. So I couldn't actually build like or like look into a more complicated case. Uh, but that is definitely something I would like to play around with at some point. So if there are any astronomers here that do have access to data, then okay. please come and let me know. Um, and yeah, so basically, yeah, as I said, the next step is to probably get more data and see um, how I could, um, if I could classify more stars, because right now I mostly just looked at DAY dwarfs just because that's what I worked on during my PhD and it's great, but to, to be fair, most astronomers aren't actually interested in DAY dwarfs. Uh, so it, it's probably going to be exciting for a small group, but not, not everyone. Last time I checked, the, if anyone's been, like, if anyone's done a lot of, like, um, or anyone's built a classifier for, uh, for stars, the last paper I personally saw was, like, from 2013, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe people are working on them. So if, if that's the case, then I'd, I'd be really interested to see what they were using. And, they were, and that, at that time, they were using random forests, actually. So it's a different method completely. And <laughs> then, um, yeah, so I'd like more data. I'd like to retrain the model. And then uh, the reason why this is like super interesting and actually like really useful, not just something that I do on the side, is that the next generations of telescopes and, and uh, satellites out there are mostly going to be spitting out data of for like millions of stars in one go. And you, I mean, no matter how many PhD students you have, you're not going to be able to get them to classify <laughs> them all. Like, let's face it, you, need, you, you actually need to have like some model to do it for you. So, um, so yeah, I think that's why it's like, it's in a way, it's kind of interesting and, and something that to look into and maybe something to give back to astronomy since, uh, since I spent so much time doing it. So yeah, thank you all. Ooh. <laughs> I'm not sure where my last slide's gone, um, but yeah, okay, it's, it was on my screen. Oh, there. I just put the link to um, uh, the, our blog at list if anyone's interested in reading what we're up to. Yeah. I do actually have the data, but then I thought of using, <coughs> sorry, I, have, I thought of using the images just because most of the time, that's what you get from like, if you're talking to different people. I've, we don't all use SDSS data. At the end of the day, I actually, all of the, the stars that I looked at were from um, another telescope, and, but they were within the same optical wavelength range. So I just thought like if someday someone just sent me the image of uh, like a spectrum in an image format, I thought that would be like pretty easy to to feed into a model. It's actually more complicated. If you've got the raw data, you could achieve better using the first method, I'm sure. Um, but then I just, I just thought of like looking at it in a more complicated way. <laughs> or just, you just apply to reading astronomical data. Yes, so I was just looking at Astrophile like a couple of days ago. <laughs> Definitely something I'll look into as well. I just I just normalized the flux. That's the only thing I did. But what, what data did you did you use? I mean, is this image data? And how do you know what is the image that you used? The astronomical image, right? Because you have oh, the the, the brist the brist descriptor. Yeah. How does that work? Can you say some of what? So um. Because you don't you didn't use deep learning. No, no, no. The deep learning. I just all I did for the deep learning for the neural net was resize them into like 224 by 224. Um, for the brist descriptor, so I'm trying, uh, sorry, let me just get back to the, that. So to be honest, I used OpenCV, which, uh, which has um, the brist descriptor calculator built in. Um, and I, I wish I could actually tell you a lot about it, but I, I read a blog post about descriptors and to kind of have an idea of what they roughly do. They have a sampling pattern. and. Um, in this case, it was just 
the one that I was told works best in terms of like rotation and, and br elimination of like of images and stuff. Not that I have that problem in my case, um, but I was just told that it's it's probably one of the better descriptors to use. And I just so for each image I just calculated this descriptor and then fed that into the. No, uh, yeah, exactly. So the way, but to get the spectrum of a star is actually quite expensive in terms of time on a telescope and, and, and time on telescope is super expensive. I mean, like your thousands of astronomers applying for, for time on a telescope that, you know, like we've got access to two telescopes from the UK in the Northern Hemisphere, technically. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's not that easy. So what you do is you kind of like use the color color diagrams to get a smaller sample of, of candidates that you're kind of like quite confident they're going to be the star that you, the type of star that you're looking for, and then you go get the spectra of these stars to identify them, like to be sure about them. Yeah, exactly. The yeah. Sure, Ben. Hey. I mean, I think they're very obviously different. Most of, like, as in, in, in both. Um, cases, the DA white dwarfs with versus the non-DA white dwarfs, and I think in, ge in, in that case, like, they deal with images much better, like the, the deep nets, so that's my guess of why it was so much better, but um, Um, no, I think it's because in the case of the deep net, what it does, it, like, it detects, like, obvious points in the, in the in the images so like in the case of the quasars you've got like really obvious emission lines that you don't have in DA white dwarfs for example that also lie in different parts of the of the image in a way and like the emission line is is quite in the blue end so in like the smaller wavelengths and i think that using using the deep net and i was using a convolutional um, neural net so you've got like it does pick out like distinct features in the image in a way and I think it will it will probably pick out the emission line versus the absorption lines that's that's what I'm guessing compared to the compared to the uh, normal s SVM that I was using okay sorry I'll go for you uh, regarding, the yeah. regarding the data you said that you were still looking for um, isn't a lot of spectral uh, optimistic data very open source and available so but I don't I don't understand with the wise yeah, is there spectra in the Y survey? I think it's mostly photometry. Yeah. Photometry. yeah. yeah. No, I'm mostly g I'm I'm after spectra, uh, in this case. Sorry, yeah, you've been waiting. <laughs> yeah. I I guess you can. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I think in my case it's probably like I actually want to classify stars, so it's so that's why I'm after that kind of data. I'd like to be able to have a model that can very confidently say this is like you know this type of star versus that. And I mean there there are quite a few classes of stars, so then that's that's kind of like what ultimately I'd, I'd like to get to. Yeah. I didn't actually go that far and check how far away from the resolution I am, but you can, you can still, in, in the case of like a, a DA white dwarf versus a quasar, you would still be able to, to see them pretty dis like easily. But then, in the case of other stars, I think it, that's when you're gonna probably have to to think about. You know, like your approach to process how you process the image before you um, feed it in, because uh, an A-type star, like a star like our sun, G-type star, you basically you you will have strong absorption lines, and 
maybe when you resize the image, you won't see how broad the absorption line is versus like a, a, a white dwarf versus a normal star. So then you could actually have an issue. But in yeah, in my case, like it was such a simple problem that I didn't I didn't actually have to worry about that at all. But it's definitely something to take into account when I ha when I get more data for sure. No, I didn't look at, um, I, I'm literally just using Spectra. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, I, we don't have uh, um, Redshift information. But that could be an, an extra indication, but I'm not sure something like SDSS would, would automatically give you that information. Like, I think you, you need to actually measure, like, you need to get multiple Spectra, measure the, how, how your lines move, right, from, from one another, and then calculate the Redshift. I don't know. I'm, I, didn't, I didn't do any extra galactic signs, so. No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's emission lines versus absorption. Emission lines, yeah. In this case, it's very simple. Fitting a Gaussian for for the H alpha, I think, would gives a much better result than someone just eyeballing. I just it was I was very surprised to hear that. It oh, that he eyeballs, yeah. One of the most miserable PhD projects. <laughs> I mean, he he, he actually did get proper work done, but then to you know, to confirm a lot of a lot of the theory that he was after, it was he had to eyeball a lot of spectra. Yep. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it seems to me like almost everyone else is doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do so many astronomers become data scientists? Good question. There aren't there aren't that many. <laughs> no, but it's true. There aren't that many postdocs available after you finish your your degree. Unless I mean, there are, but they're not in the UK, and you have to be really flexible to move and and all that, uh, I personally wasn't, so I guess that's why. But then I also think that you, you, a lot of astronomers use Python a lot, which helps when you try to switch to data science. And then, yeah, just doing a lot of maths and stuff during your PhD probably also gets you a job in data science. So, yeah. Probably we did a big data long before on the path to science, because uh, surveys, I guess, are considered big data. Yeah, but like also big catalogs of stars. So those surveys have like millions and millions of, of stellar objects in them. So just, you know, like you do have to query databases and you do have to, to eventually like process a lot of data to get to, like for me to get to the 50 white dwarfs that I found, like I, I had to go through a lot. <laughs> like it wasn't, it wasn't that simple. Like I, at the, at the same time, released a catalog of like 14 million stars. So y I guess you're right. You do deal with a lot of big data at the same time if... Uh, if you do play with surveys. Yeah. No, I do, I do, I would like to go that, I would like to look into that, but I just managed to get it to work like and a week ago. How <laughs> just five layers. Sorry? Um, no, the only thing I did was change the data set from a non-balanced data set to a balanced data set. That was the, that's what gave me like a huge difference and improvement. But I didn't, I didn't really remove, first I thought, oh, let me just go all out and try a VGG sort of model. And that was like, that was taking ages. And then I just went back to like an AlexNet type. Um, but I didn't, I didn't think of removing any of the layers. I could play around and then just see how much worse or better it goes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah.
I could. I didn't, I didn't think of doing that. Um, in the case of the, it, it was about 20% as well. Yeah, sorry. That, yeah, it was about 20%. I, d I split the, the data set manually. I shuffled them and then split them into about 20% as well. Yeah. If you don't have any more questions, I'll turn to you again. Thanks. <laughs>